I'm going to just kind of share uh, one method that I've used uh, in my education experience. Um, a little bit of what it is, why it's used, and how to implement it, um, and then maybe some kind of uh, open-ended questions to think about. Um, before I get into a little bit about myself, um, here's an example, and maybe I know we have some educators here. Uh, who, who's been here before in a Zoom call? You just said an open-ended question. You're the only one with your webcam on. Everyone's got it muted. You're staring at the black void. Um, or, and it's just you, right? No one's saying anything. <laughs> you just realize you've lost engagement. Like whatever conversation it is, let alone the classroom. This can happen. Um, of course, this can happen in person as well. Um, this isn't to say that some educators require a webcam. Some institutions do require you know students to have their webcam on. Some don't. Um, whatever your practices are, you know there there are some times where we might feel like this. So how can we explore different ways to engage learners? in an online platform. Now, as well as uh, thinking in the physical-based classroom, I know a lot of educators still use um, you know, the Canvas system, Google Sites, whatever the online platform is, will facilitate in person and say, hey, go online, do the, do the assignments, come back tomorrow, we'll talk about it. So we're still using online platforms um, every day. So my name is Julio Gonzalez. Some of you may know me as Jules. I have been working in education technology for the past six years as a teacher, as um, a specialist, uh, working on um, different types of projects. I've been working with a nonprofit out of Idaho who uh, specialize in creating um, immersive technology methods for uh, people with autism and their families. So learning methods, skill building methods, um, uh, anxiety strategy management methods. So different types of approaches to uh, neurodiversity as a whole and how emerging technology is integrated into daily life. So I come to you today as, um, not only as an educator, but I understand that there's ways that we can engage learners um, in that gray area that Dr. Matto was kind of talking about. There's, of course, one way to learn in physical form. There's another way to learn virtually. There's an in-between. Um, some of us may understand that even during the pandemic, some students did thrive because they were given full agency to learn remotely. Um, some did not, of course, many did not, right? Um, in the physical format, um, yeah, some learners do struggle because of spatial anxieties, because of maybe some disconnects, maybe it is a matter of um, simple accessibility as well. So the, uh, the, the project I'm gonna show you today is just a test example of a 3D environment of a classroom. So we're going to be uh, looking at a tool called framevr.il. Um, it does, uh, there's AI implemented into this whole process and through some of the components here. But essentially we're going to be looking at a web-based meeting platform that can be integrated into a Canvas page, into a Google Sites page. So looking at the, uh, you know, I'm also thinking about kind of the infrastructure to, to all of this. And in my research, I've been able to kind of gather throughout some of these web-based meeting platforms, which ones are already being used in schools, which ones have the high user-friendly interface for teachers and, and students. So anyways, FrameVR.io is the thing we're gonna be looking at today. I'll share some others. It's a 3D environment based in a web browser. So you'll be able to get a link just like a Zoom um, or a, a virtual conference link. It's multi-user or single user. So I'll explain what that means a bit. Um, you know, you can have an instance where anyone can log into the same uh, environment, but they won't be seeing each other, but they can still interact with the environment. And all of the content here is drag and drop. So granted, again, I understand that there's a learning curve to learning a new tool and integrating a new platform into an already embedded curriculum that you know works. So just taking a look at what this can look like. Um, so this, here's just an example of the Canvas page, um, and we're using an embedded code. Um, and I'll explain a little bit of what that means. But essentially, um, the, what I'm doing here is I'm just clicking and dragging with my mouse, using the arrow keys to move throughout the environment. So in this uh, example, we have kind of really a conceptual classroom of the Idaho fish um, water system. So the life forms uh, involved. We're gonna look at some of the various tools that you can explore to look at interactivity in some of these spaces. Um, other components that you are already typically using, 
um, and I want to just kind of reference that quite a bit throughout. I understand that um, educators have a go-to curriculum. Maybe it is something that they're changing every year, um, maybe every semester, um, every week even. I, I can understand that Yahoo or curriculum, even as AX, you know, is emerging, there's always going to be new concepts that you want to integrate into your classroom. So that being said, um, this isn't to disregard the process that is already in place for most teachers. So uh, again, right, it's an embedded Canvas page. The controls, right, uh, very rudimentary. I'm using the WASD keys or the arrow keys for my mouse to navigate the space. Now, uh, young learners are already familiar with these controls, right? Gaming, Minecraft, Roblox, Fortnite. This, this is meeting them where they're at when it comes to um, user agency and, and giving them uh, another dimension to, you know, instead of go up and down on the page, they're not going, you know, into it, right? Um, so just kind of uh, exploring and kind of opening you, opening us all up to that idea here. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly go through some of the components that is uh, usable uh, in these spaces. So PDFs, right? You might already have your documents. You can just drag those in. The button things are already uh, integrated, so it reads. It's a document. I can now click through the documents and go through um, a uh, learning module. There are these interactive whiteboards. So in a single user, they could be doing some sketching. If I'm doing a multi-user environment, I could be doing my typical whiteboard session. Open discussion, I could have a bunch of these. So every student has their own whiteboard. A, let's, you know, if it is maybe an art class or maybe it is uh, some math problems that you're working through, you can be sketching or tutoring students through the whiteboard sessions as you typically would. Another reminder here that these platforms are very uh, reminiscent of a video conference. So uh, the microphone control is available, the video camera control is available, chat functions are available. Um, so it's, it has all the same tools as a typical video conference online learning platform. Slide shows as well, you would just import those, they come in in the landscape. You can scale them up as much as you'd like, sift through them as if you're sharing a slideshow. Videos as well, um, of all kinds, not just the typical format. You can do 360 videos or just typical videos. Uh, volume control, pausing control, um, both for the group or just for the user. So you can definitely create a space where if you're telling a story, um, sending the students through um, things you know that are relevant. Here's a little bit of a peek as to what a multi-user environment could look like. So. Um, Every user has their avatar, they have the default robot, you can change the colors, you can even change the robot into a human and customize the human. Of course, uh, player agency here is really important. Um, having someone you know, represent themselves as they would like to be seen on all spectrums, I think is really important. So, you know, again, you can also kind of think about, um, you know, in, in a typical online learning platform, um, like let's say a video conferencing platform, right? You don't really know what they're paying attention to or if they're paying attention. So, you know, like back to the icebreaker at the beginning, um, you don't really know if they're actually listening or what they're looking at or what part of their the presentation they're looking at. But if your presentation or if your if your concepts for the week or for the semester are spatial, you can definitely see like where is Josh paying attention to? What is he really focusing on? Um, you know, what intrigues? Um, you know, Charlie, what are they looking at, right? What type of thing is a certain student interested in? So you might be sharing your your instruction, right, as a concept, and maybe you're allowing them to explore as you're explaining because you don't need to be in a, in a set space. They're still hearing you, and they're hearing you talk about a certain species of fish. So anyways, one piece of the idea of the multi-user environment is that you can isolate sound areas, so this is another drag and drop thing. It's the sound sound zone is what it's called, and you can just plop it in, and um, you can create a breakout room basically. So in the idea of a you know a emergent classroom where um, not only you have a learning space, but you kind of have an evaluation space perhaps, or kind of a collaborative space, you can tell your students, hey, go into this area. I want you to consider what this fish species is. Tell me what this is. Go in the room 10 minutes, come back, and let's talk about who has the right answer. You might find the right answer in the previous space where that answer will be found somewhere, right, in the space. So it gives you, gives them the opportunity to explore, to find the answer, to come back, and then you know we, we kind of go through the breakout room format. 
Now, probably the most intriguing component to most of these web-based environments is the use of 3D models. Uh, while this can seem intimidating, um, there are a plethora. To implement them and to implement any component, you are hitting this little plus button. You're exploring all the different um, options for content. So for 3D, they already have a plethora of assets available. You can just drag and drop, and then you can kind of rotate things as you'd like. Um, you know, whether it be just kind of typical classroom assets, that's okay. But there's also an embedded search function to a library called Sketchfab, which is all user-made content. So you can just search dog, and then immediately that would import into the scheme. So, right, you can imagine all the different types of topics out there, right? Teaching methods, right? If it is bi biology of fish, right, you have anatomy. If it's math, right, you can get you know, quantifiable scale and sizing of, of how things are, are changing um, throughout equations. Maybe it is just characters. Maybe it is just to lighten up the space to have a classroom mascot, right? Or to um, let the students kind of configure the space in a way that tells a story, right? There's, there's uh, so many different options. Um, so different ways to get 3D models. Um, of course, there's uh, a bunch of model libraries, uh, Sketchfab, Turbo Squid, CG Trader, and 3D Archive. These are all open source files available for educators to use, for educational use. Um, so again, really, sky's the limit, really. Any kind of 3D model you could look for, again, I'll have this presentation available. So um, now, probably one of the more recent things to explore here is um, how else can we get 3D models that is same means as accessible for, for teachers to, to, to have ideas for. So this is one of many emerging tools. Uh, CSM AI and Alpha 3D are two different AI tools. You can look them up. Um, essentially what they do is you give them an image, they give you a model. And there's a process there, but essentially it's they're, they're working on it being more and more user experience um, accessible. But the idea here is that, yeah, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, you download the model, and then you can upload it into your environment and go from there, right? So if your ideas are a sketch, if your ideas are a source image, you can definitely try and add some more dimension to it if you'd like, because um, you are working with a spatial environment. Now, another piece here to um, think about in terms of how AI is used uh, from an educator's perspective, I'm going to take the link of the space, and I'm going to ask this chatbot to uh, give me a embedded link of this link. So I copied the link, now I'm pasting it. Give me an embedded link of this link. So then it gives me the embedded code. It's a little box here, and it's a little blurry, but it gives you a little copy box, and then I can just copy that code that it gave me and put it into the embedded code block that is available for Canvas, for Google Sites, and Google Classrooms, among others, that allow embedded code. Um, and just like that, um, I know it went by pretty quick. I'll, I'll let the video loop. Um, but yeah, once I pasted the embedded code, it just shows into the Canvas page, and I'm ready to go. Um, now, for the settings of the space themselves, you'll see there's a little gear. Um, there's a lot of uh, back-end settings that the educator would need to set up. So enable password protection, enable um, no emojis to be used, or, or enable them if you'd like them to. Enable single or multi-user. Those are kind of like the, the top three that usually people pay attention to, or always disable webcam, or always disable mic, stuff like that. Um, typical kind of Zoom settings. Um, but here's the embedded code thing again. So there is a button that's available in Canvas. It's the embedded button. You paste your embedded code. So whatever chatbot you're using to get an embedded code. There is embedded code makers already out there, generators. Um, but in terms of just providing access, um, you know, we, we're, that's kind of where I'm referencing the, the use of the AI, AI tool here. So the breakdown again, I create my space, get my link, go to my generator, whether it's an AI or just a typical uh, embedded frame, uh, iframe maker, uh, embedded code maker. And then I take that code and I bring it into my learning platform. That's the that's the most direct integration of using a 3D environment. Um, of course, you could just stop here, right, and just keep the classroom in frame. But I understand too that there are um, 
there's there's the infrastructure, right? The the use of a new platform and a new tool into an institution that already has a lot of policies in place. So, granted, having this be embedded into DAP, as we know, is part of the education system already. Um, is the way that we can do that. Um, however, there are institutions that have explored just using the frame itself and not embedding them into the education platform. So, uh, oh, back. Uh, one other piece to just kind of touch on in terms of the spatial environments, you can also drag and drop 360 photos. 360 photos are also widely available through Google Earth Network or just through Google Images. You can type Skybox or 360 photo of whatever location, and you'll definitely find some results. You can download those images. They just are really large JPEG images, and then Frame will pick up what those are um, by importing the Skybox, and that's what these little bubbles are. You can just click on them, and then they change the environment. So again, thinking of learning content, if you're trying to take people through a space, through maybe a location, uh, maybe this is an exploration of a certain space. So um, you may have noticed, right, framevr.io is the name, but it's really an XR platform, and I'll explain what that is. Uh, XR, Extended Reality Technology, is an umbrella term for various immersive technology, um, for various uses of software and hardware that are all engaging the user in new and interesting ways. Um, so framevr, um, the big focus for a long time was virtual reality, right? And I haven't even talked about that yet. But the most interesting part about XR is it's something that's accessible via web browser, via smartphone, tablet, uh, computers, uh, headsets, augmented reality, mixed reality devices, even like the new Apple Vision Pro, like an, an XR headset because it's accessing all different types of content. Um, I'm back. Um, so, Again, right, so looking at it in the mobile format lens, um, again, just to get a little bit here about accessibility too, right? So, um, you know, if it is through a phone or a mobile device, you'll get user control through a little joystick button. Um, and so that's just when they open the link through their mobile device, that's um, kind of how that looks. Of course, with VR, you have full range of motion, so if I were to access the link through my headset, I would be able to do that. Some organizations have access to this type of technology. Of course, many don't. So that's just something to consider. Uh, again, all of this is in, in sync. So let's say I have a multi-user environment. Some of my users have headsets. Some of mine don't. But we're all in the same space together. Um, so what are those spaces? What do they look like? Uh, capital T, templates, right? I think the, the word that a lot of educators do like is they don't have a lot of time to make these things, right? They don't have a lot of time to make these environments the assets, but they do have the curriculum. So if we just give them that um, that means for, for putting their content into the space, I think that's uh, really important. So Frame has, and among other platforms, have the templates already made. They are working on AI-generated environments. So you can type in a prompt, it'll give you a skybox. Type in a prompt, it'll give you certain models. So you can really think about how quickly some of these environments can be built. Um, Again, just thinking about from the educator's perspective, I understand how time consuming it can be to set up a new web, a new classroom page. You know, I think probably the one of the biggest reliefs for me is once I got my curriculum built, I felt like, oh, that was my first good semester. I'll probably use the same thing next semester just because I don't have the time to go through everything again, right? Um, but of course, uh, every teacher's different. So, anyways. A lot of different spaces um, from something more uh, concentrated, more concentrated spaces, more classroom typical spaces. But classrooms don't have to be the same way, right? They don't have to look like this space here, right? They can be anywhere, right? Um, anything. You can go to the moon and play basketball on the moon, right? Um, so, you know, this might just be a way, maybe, it, maybe it's not so much about the learning content, but maybe it's about giving that breath of fresh air to the student, maybe giving them a break from typical learning. Um, but at the end of the day, all of these, all of these environments, all of these concepts that I've shared with you, the what of this tool, um, they all kind of amount to constructivist learning elements, right? So typical, uh, you know, education 101 type uh, emergent concepts when it comes to open-ended learning, uh, explorative learning, they all kind of come down to uh, constructivism. So 
it, it, what I'm saying here is including some of these principles into this method is going to definitely help. So um, looking at high learner agency, loser, uh, sorry, learner centered um, approach to uh, to the content, knowledge building, cooperative learning. So out of the University of Maryland, uh, Dr. Dodge has been able to identify a really simplified model of constructivism into five uh, five E's. So engage uh, engage the user, engage the learner into something new, something fresh, something interesting, uh, somewhat of a spatial environment. Allow them to explore, right? Of course, giving them that space, right? Go check this out. Let's come back. Extend. Make the connections between the things in the space. And then typical things, explain and evaluate, right? Give your instruction, evaluate via a quiz or via discussion, however you see fit. But essentially, like most constructivism works, you know, in education, um, we know that these are concepts that there's a lot of research behind. It's all social infrastructure of learning. It's all the same principles, just in a method that is enhanced online learning. Uh, in, in regards to the environment, and this is my architecture brain speaking just a bit, um, really what it comes down to is three areas of engagement based on distance. So whatever's closest, and then further and further. So the primary area is whatever right, whatever's right in front of the user. So if you let them start in a certain area in the spot, you might have them, hey, welcome to the space. Over here is the next thing, right? So that's the second area. The tertiary area, the yellow area here is just things that are in the distance that are within eye distance. So, you know, we know that there's signage. You know, when we go to the airport, we see uh, the user experience of going to the airport is there's a lot of signage, right? That's just areas of engagement. So I'm just talking about how you can use those principles in a learning environment as well. Uh, what this comes to, though, using constructivism, using spatial learning, um, it comes to this really good cycle of knowledge and practice through learning. So some ideas here, right, for using um, identified constructivist method into spatial learning is, of course, you, you can have peer collaboration. I think web quests are an interesting one, right? Scavenger hunts, stuff like that. Things that can really make a connection between the content and the learner. <coughs> And this isn't new, right? So Frame, as long as, uh, as well as other platforms, have been around for about a decade, and they've been growing, right? Um, used in various institutions already. Um, there's other educational organizations that work uh, with these tools. So uh, out of a state college in Florida, looking at robotics championships as an extracurricular, used art galleries, MIT has a media lab uh, that they use as a collaboration space. Uh, there's an entire uh, school based in this um, platform, uh, and they use a lot of these different methods to uh, develop their classroom, so that's based in Australia. Um, looking at some of the other platforms, again, I'll share this link, but um, feel free to just kind of take note of them. Um, now, the thing with doing research in this field, I understand, definitely as an educator in public schools, at the college level, and at club and private schools, um, there's there's all sorts of all, all sorts of tools out there, right? Um, everything has pros and cons, as again, Dr. Maddow said, not everything's perfect, right? Not every tool is gonna be perfect. But what we can do is try and perfect our way of adapting to tools. We can try and do our best to identify, okay, maybe for entertainment, I probably wanna use one of these over training. But definitely for education and accessibility, which one has the most? And that's kind of where I kind of amount to using training the most, but these are all gonna be different. Um, Blacksmith XR, I do think, has a pretty strong education focus um, in terms of actually um, looking at uh, game design as the education itself. So they have, they've actually gamified the learning of gaming and teaching gaming. So uh, that's kind of an interesting one to explore, but um, things that I think we should all consider here, right? I mean, I know I've shared a lot, it's a lot to take in, um, but essentially, if we were to think about our class curriculum in a format that is spatial, 3D, um, you know, I, I'd say consider trying it or consider integrating it for resource sheet. Again, I'll have this available. Um, Frame specifically has taken the time to address some of those concerns through an SOC2 report uh, addressing their user privacy policies. So um, again, student privacy, I understand, is definitely like, okay, if we're going to make something, if we're going to integrate it into the next step of our um, 
allowances for our educators, um, student privacy usually comes first, and I totally understand that. So um, that being said, they've uh, released a report that um, allows institutions to take a look at, think about how they can collaborate in a way that can make it work, at least for experimental purposes or even for typical purposes. So um, that being said, right, they, um, they've made uh, efforts to ensure that their uh, user information is not um, traded or sold to third parties, but regardless, um, I wanna thank you again for coming. I know it's, I kind of went through that. Uh, we still have a, a good 15 minutes. Uh, among any other questions I'd love to answer, there is the opportunity here. To, if you'd like to try the space for yourself right now, you can view the QR code. Yeah, jump in. If you have internet connection through your data on your phone or on your tablet, um, this will take you to the space, um, to the 3D environment. So I'll go through that too with you. Uh, the QR code to all of this, to the resources links that we just saw in the last slide. Uh, in the resources link, I'm gonna skip uh, y'all. Yeah, in the resources link, there is AI tools, a uh, bunch of links to the image to 3D generator, um, to some of the research that's put into some of these concepts. Um, so yeah, at the end of the day though, you know, it's, it's about thinking about what are some of the, you know, ways that we can really create something interesting for our students because they deserve something different, they deserve something new. Um, so yeah, I'll open up to any questions or if you'd like to just give it a try. Um, I see some of you might be doing that, so. Yes, yeah. So is it free to anyone? Yes, great question. Yes, it is free to use, yep. So you just, um, you, you can actually, so it's free to just uh, participate as a, um, as a participant. If you'd like to make your own space, it is also free. Uh, a lot of web platforms, though, um, granted they are businesses, they have business models. Uh, they have found different ways, and they're still changing today, but uh, a lot of these platforms, including Frame, uh, how they monetize is they create a user limit. So they might request an educator license, so it would be a subscription-based service that you would get the availability to have more users in a space at a time, but that doesn't mean you can't use the single user space indefinitely. It's only if you wanna include like over 25 people, over 50 people, then you start to pay a subscription, stuff like that, yeah. Which I appreciate too, yeah, again, I appreciate your questions because open source uh, business models are really important, but I also understand there's a business angle to that as well, um, but I think the more that people use a product, the more exposure you get anyway. But what does the teacher have with respect to listening in or grabbing screenshots, monitoring? Yes, absolutely. So, you know, it functions the same as a, um, I think I'll just switch and kind of have it going forward here. Um, so the, um, okay, so yeah, the typical format is, if you were to think about this as just an enhanced version of video conferencing, you have the functions of administrator tools. So if you need to mute everyone at a, at a moment's notice, if you need to kick someone out, if they're being disrespectful, of course, um, full monitor, of course. But yeah, you have full full range of audio. You can enable spatial audio, meaning if my avatar's over here, it's probably not gonna hear the avatars over there. Um, you can allow that if you'd like, um, but uh, there's a chat function as well. You can download the history, you can clear the history. Um, so there, there is all the typical um, online learning uh, control methods. Yeah. yeah. So if you imagine this world of virtual reality, yeah. right? I'm a student, I want to talk to another student to work with a project. Can they do that like exclusively or do they have to be tagged to each other in this? Uh, no, no, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, this instance itself is set to single user. So it, some of you are in the same space, right? But, it, but we can't see each other. Um, but the link is always live in that sense. So if I enable multi-user, we'll be able to see each other as avatars. So he's logged in. So um, it, it's it's almost like a live Zoom room at all times. Oh, okay. And you can disable and enable it. Oh, so okay. if you do want to schedule time, you would enable the room and then everyone would join during their set time. Or if you want it to be passive, hey, this is your workspace, this is your collaboration space. I might drop in to say hi, just like a lab space, just like a physical lab space. On the uh, bandwidth, 
Will it be a problem for like a, someone that has like a low internet connection or right. will it also adapt to that? Yeah, um, you know, honestly, I haven't seen too many issues. Oh. Um, kind of going from remote to like a data plan to a Wi-Fi mm -hmm. plan. Um, and again, just kind of through myself uh, assessing the different platforms, mm -hmm. they do struggle with that. Um, yeah. And I haven't, and I think I'm, and I do feel like part of the process that they've been able to develop is focusing on bandwidth first, mm -hmm. focusing on scale first. Um, granted, you know, I'm not an official spokesperson, but uh, I'm definitely an advocate for, you know, new and engaging methods. So, yeah. Especially if you're putting things together, like the graphics, image, context, like mm -hmm. there's a lot of data into the space right here. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, you know, there's loading times. Um, there's actually a hard point limit. So there's like mm -hmm. a red bar that pops up somewhere and it says, it'll tell you, hey, there's too many objects in your space. Try deleting some. Mm -hmm. uh, it's going to, it's going to take up bandwidth. So at least it gives you indicators to try and manage that. Um, yeah. So did, was there a question over here? Oh, yes. I'm a teacher and I'm thinking I could use this as a virtual field trip and I'm wondering like do you have to use an avatar like if I'm looking at the cameras and I don't want to see their faces maybe I want to demonstrate something and I need them to see me yes it has that capability yeah absolutely right? you've got your avatar right and you'll see a little um a little screen pop up over their head and it's oh. your live webcam yeah. Oh, so wow. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. yeah. You can go to full phone. Yeah. Um, I'd love to demonstrate that. There I am. Oh. oh um, yeah. yeah. Okay. Why don't you? So here's the single user mode. So I'm just gonna disable this. And then if anyone wants to refresh the page, I'll... right now my limit is just set to eight. Um. So I'll just get rid of the echo. Okay. Yeah, disable mics. <laughs> So, yeah, if you want to turn your webcam on here. I think what's one of the first things for me when I started to step into one of these environments was um, just the social interaction. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I noticed myself like, oh, I'm actually too close to these people. I'm, I'm going to take a step back because I want space. Right, and but that doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in a virtual environment, so you know it, you start to pick up on yourself. Oh wait, I'm actually starting to act like this is an actual environment. But you know, granted, like this is just traditional format for the game designers, programmers out there. You can actually um, create entire experiences here. So when I click on an object, X Y Z happens. So they have a version visual coding system. The the integration between Canvas and uh, Google Classroom. Cool. Is it seamless? Like, how does that work? Is yeah. it embedded or an API that's driving that connection? Or what? Right. So, so with Google Classroom, mm -hmm. it's not a direct embedded like live, but with Google Sites, it is live. Oh, okay. um, and I do think that I would like to see Google Classroom be more um, uh, embedded focus. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that their um, it feels like their format is very um, async when it comes to their workflow Yeah. Um, in terms of engaging with their learners, in mm -hmm. my personal opinion. But um, you know, that being said, I'm sure that there's more options out there. But I know Google Sites kind of complements okay. classrooms. So, so, yeah. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much for coming.